A story is told of a father and a son who were out to clean their yard one day. The father divided the yard up a little bit and he told his son to work on one section and he was going to work on another section. And the young boy was going out there cleaning up his part and all of a sudden he came across a big rock, a rock that was just a little bit too much for him to handle. And he was out there trying to pull it one way and trying to pull it another way and eventually the father came over to him and he asked his son, son, are you trying to move that rock with all your strength? And he says, yes, Dad, I am working with all my strength. And the father says, no, you're not, son. He says, yes, but I am. I am doing with all the might that I have. And the father says, you haven't asked me to help you yet, because asking me to help you is part of the strength. You know, in our Christian experience, we often have tried to repent and try to remove sins out of the, our lives with the same type of success as that young little boy had. We still have to learn to depend upon God to be forgiven of our sins. Now when we talk about God and when we talk about forgiveness and when we talk about Christianity, there's oftentimes a misunderstanding, a misunderstanding between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. We somehow think that the God of the Old Testament was mean and severe. The God of the New Testament was loving and kind and forgiving. But you know something? The Bible tells us something about the character of our God. Let's look at Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. Malachi 3 and verse 6. It says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. He says, I am the Lord and I don't change. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, Hebrews 13 verse 8, it talks about Jesus in the same way. Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God that we worship is the same. He is the same in the Old Testament and the same in the New. Now we may think to ourselves, oh, but that's not so. We think of God as quite severe in the Old Testament. Well, let's take a look at Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 32. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 32. What type of God did we worship back then? Verse 32 says, For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. So back there in the Old Testament, that same God was pleading with people to turn. That same God was saying, Oh, I don't want to see anyone to be destroyed. Now, why does God have such a willingness to forgive? Why is it? What type of character is in our God? Let's look at Psalm 78, verse 38. Psalm 78 and verse 38. But He, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned He His anger away and did not stir up all His wrath. You see, even in the Old Testament, that God always gave mercy as much as He possibly could to be able to help the people. Now, one of the greatest statements of God's willingness to forgive is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 through 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 through 14. On this particular occasion, we find that this was the, the time that the temple was being dedicated 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 through 14. And the Lord appeared unto Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Yes, this was right back there in the Old Testament. God was saying, no matter what type of punishments may come upon you and the punishment are there only to wake them up. No matter what I do to wake you up, if you turn to the Lord, you will have forgiveness and God will remove the consequences. You see, He is so full of compassion that it forms a part of His character. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 9, it illustrates it very clearly. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 9. Again, another prayer, this time the prayer of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 9. 
He says, To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against Him. Even though we have rebelled against Him, to God belongs what? Belongs mercies and forgiveness. That's the type of God that we worship. He is so eager to save. He is so eager to help us that this forms a part of His character. Now when we talk about forgiveness, what is one of the very first steps in receiving forgiveness? Well, we studied not long ago about the Holy Spirit. And in John chapter 16 and verse 8, let's read it again. John chapter 16 and verse 8, speaking about the Holy Spirit. When He is come, He will reprove or convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So the very first thing that the Holy Spirit is what it does is comes to convict us, to convince us that we are doing wrong. So now how can we who are doing wrong, how can we find the forgiveness of God? What must we do to be able to find that forgiveness? Psalm chapter 86 verse 5. Psalm 86 and verse 5 records what we need to be doing. Psalm 86 verse 5 says, For Thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plentous in mercy unto all them that call upon Thee. God is ready to give plenty of mercy to whoever calls upon Him. We need to take that opportunity to call upon the Lord. Well, you see, what do we do when we call upon the Lord? What does it mean? We need to be able to come together and reason with God. In Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, Isaiah 1 18 says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God simply wants us to come together. God wants to reason together with us. You see, He is a very reasonable being. He wants to come and work things out for us to understand. Now what is involved in reasoning together with God? What is involved? You know, on the day of Pentecost, we find the experience of the apostles as people were coming out to hear and they heard the messages and they wanted to find repentance. What did they do? How were they led to the point of repentance? Let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Keep in mind, this is a little bit over a month after Peter was reconverted. And this is one of his first sermons there on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, that when they heard what Peter was preaching, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and, bre men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, what did these apostles say to such a people? When they were convicted now, the Holy Spirit brought conviction to their hearts. What did the apostles do? Matter of fact, what did they tell them to start with? What was it that they said that pricked their conscience? Verse 36 says, Therefore let us all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He made sure that they understood that they crucified Jesus that they had to take a personal responsibility for what happened there. It wasn't the Romans. Sure, we can blame the Romans. Yeah, they did the crucifixion. But it was the Jewish people themselves that led them to that point. And what about each one of us personally? Have we personally crucified Christ? Until we recognize that our sins have put Jesus on Calvary, we can never find that conviction that God wants. You see, God so loved not just the world, God so loved you, God so loved me, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him, yes, that if you believe in Him, Whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It is our sins that put Jesus on the cross. And what are we to do about them? What are we to do about it? Let's take a look at the answer that Peter gave to them when they were pricked in their hearts. Verse 38 says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What were they to do? The first thing that they were to do, it says, Repent and be baptized. Notice it did not say be baptized first and then repent. Oh no, it says specifically to them, repent 
and be baptized. They had to experience personal repentance. They had to recognize that I have crucified Jesus, that I put Jesus on Calvary. And it's not until we have that experience, a personal recognition, that God is able to help us. So what does it mean to repent? What does it mean that we are to be repenting? The word repent means, and I'll just give you a dictionary definition here, it means to feel remorse or regret as for something one has done or failed to do, to be contrite, to change one's mind concerning past actions because of disappointment, failure, etc. Or three, to feel such sorrow for one's sins as to reform. Four, to feel remorse or regret for the action or sin. And five, to change one's mind concerning past actions. Now there are different types of repentance and we need to make sure that we understand the right type of repentance because we need true repentance. If we don't have true repentance we'll never experience the joy that God intends for us to have. Well to begin with I'm not going to look at the true repentance first. I want to look at the bad repentance because I want us to keep in mind the good repentance later on. The, first, the one example that I want to use in regards to false repentance is the repentance of Judas Iscariot. In Matthew chapter 26 verses 14 through 16, Matthew chapter 26 verses 14 through 16 records the experience of Judas. Matthew 26 14 through 16 says, Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will ye give me and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. So what happened here? Judas Iscariot went over to the chief priest and he says, What are you going to give me to betray Jesus? And they told him thirty pieces of silver. He took it and he looked for a way to betray Jesus. Well, his first opportunity came on this night just before the crucifixion. We find this in verses 47 to 49. Matthew 26, verses 47 to 49. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, this is while he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then they came they and lay hands on Jesus and took him. Judas went ahead and he betrayed Jesus for a little 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. Well, as Judas was watching what was happening, as Judas saw Jesus being taken on the road to Calvary, but before even Calvary, when he saw Jesus being taken to the judgment hall, to the trials, when he was scourged, when he was beaten, how did Judas feel about all that he had done? Matthew 27, verse 3, Then Judas, when he betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. So what did Judas do? He, as he saw all that was happening to Jesus, he repented himself. And then what? He brought all the money back, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? What did he do? He says, oh, I have betrayed innocent blood. He recognized what he had done. What did Judas do then? What was the result of this? It may seem that, oh, it was repentance, but no. It was just sorrow for the consequences of his own actions. And what did he do as a result? What was the result of this type of repentance? Let's look at verse 5. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. That's the result of this type of repentance. If you're repenting only for the sake of the consequences like Judas did, it is of no value whatsoever. In this particular case, it did not bring him peace and joy. You see, true repentance will bring us peace. It will bring us joy. It will bring us that happiness that God intends for us to have. 
but his was not. His brought deeper remorse until finally he went and hanged himself. What a tragedy to the end of a life, the end of a man who spent three and a half years together with Jesus at the end of those three and a half years to end up on the end of a rope. Well, what type of repentance is this? You see, there is two types of repentance. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 11. Paul again writes, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceived that the same epistle had made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Notice here, godly sorrow does what? It works a type of repentance from which you do not need to repent of. In other words, there is a type of repentance that when you are through repenting, you actually need to repent that you even made that type of repentance. That's right, it's not even valued with God. So now, this was the experience of Judas. He repented, but that repentance was of no value. That repentance was another sin that he just added up. And he needs to repent of that sin if he was going to be saved. But it was too late. He got so remorseful that he hanged himself before he could do that repentance. But now we have an example of true repentance. There's another man in the Bible that we find that had the genuine experience of repentance that God wants you and me to possess. It, it's the experience of David. David had sinned, you remember, he had committed a sin with Bathsheba. And we find that David's mind to a great degree became numb after that sin. For all, about a year, his mind was so clouded, he did not even see what he was doing until one day Nathan the prophet came to him. And when Nathan the prophet came to him, he was able to help him out. But what happened during that year? What was, David, what was going on through the mind of David? He writes about this in Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4. What was his experience during that time? When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roarings all the day long. What was happening? When he kept silent, his bones were waxing old. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of a summer. Notice here what was going on. His, he was getting old. He was getting weary. He didn't know what to do with himself. And that's what happens with sin. Unless it is cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, it's going to destroy us. And it was destroying David. And then one day, you read the story there in 2 Samuel chapter 12, but one day God in His mercy sent the prophet Nathan to meet David. And when he came to David, he told him a story to be able to help him out a little bit. He told him a story about two neighbors. And when David gave the condemnation of the one that was in the wrong, Nathan then turned to David and said, Thou art a man. And when David saw that Nathan said that to him, then suddenly David's mind was woken up. He realized what he was doing and what was his result then. What did he do as a result? Let's look at Psalm 32 and verse 5. Psalm 32 verse 5. How did David once again have that peace, that joy once again restored? It says, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. You see, David realized that there's only one thing that you can do to find that peace, and that is to acknowledge the transgressions. Many people would have killed Nathan and said, okay, you come to talk to the king like that, we'll take care of you but not so with David. David realized that the only way to peace and happiness is to acknowledge his sin. And so if you want to find peace and joy, then it's not to cover up. Covering up actually makes things a lot more complicated. It adds sin and another sin to that sin and another, another sin to that sin. Oh, cover-ups are very dangerous. And so a, the best solution is to acknowledge our sins before the Lord. And this is what David did. He acknowledged his sin. He did not acknowledge his sin because he was afraid of the transgression, the consequences. He said, let the consequences come what may. 
He can have the consequences, but it was his own sin that he did not want. He wanted to find that peace and happiness. In Psalm 51, David records that particular experience. Psalm 51. Let's just read some of this for a moment just to see the response of David when he found that peace. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. His desire was that his sins would be blotted out, that they blotted out of existence. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, Thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. He was begging, he was pleading for help. Wash me that I may be whiter than snow. Make me to hear the joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Oh, he was pleading, pleading for that forgiveness, pleading for that restoration that God is able to give. And he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. He was looking at what, what, the, what the results were. He didn't care about the other consequences, but he wanted to have his relationship with God again. He wanted to have that peace and joy in his life restore the peace that he had for so many years. Is that what you're looking for? Are you looking for that type of peace? Well, there's only one way to find it. It is not to cover up. It is to acknowledge our sins, to acknowledge our sins before the Lord. Now, this type of repentance, true, is not normal. You know, many times we take a look at David's sins and we excuse ourselves sometimes saying, well, David did it, so can I. But you know something? David had that repentance. Do we have that type of repentance? Do we have the type of results that David had? You see, we need to look more about the consequences of the sins and the earnestly pleading that David had to be restored. We need to have that same type of pleading. But a repentance such as this is beyond the reach of our own power to accomplish. It is attained only from Christ who ascended up on high and has given gifts to men. You see, this type of repentance is not human. This type of repentance is not natural. It doesn't come from our human hearts that way. You see, repentance actually is a gift from God. Let us take a look at Acts chapter 5, verse 30 and 31. Acts chapter 5, verse 30 and 31. This is a beautiful passage here that talks about the gift of repentance. It says this way, Him hath God exalted with His right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. The word is give. Tell me something. Do we earn a gift? Do we work for a gift? No. When we work for something, it's called wages. But here it says that this was given. He gives something. What does he give? It says here he gives forgiveness. Right? God gives forgiveness. Forgiveness is received only by, totally by the mercy of the one dispensing the forgiveness. Now notice here though, in the same breath, there's the word and, for to give repentance and forgiveness to Israel. So here we have that repentance is just as equally a gift as is forgiveness. If you want to have forgiveness, if you want to have this type of forgiveness, you first must repent. But to have this type of repentance, it is a gift from God. So what do you do? Well, if you don't have something and you know it's a gift, you can always ask for it. And as we ask for forgiveness, many times we pray to the Lord, Lord, forgive me of my sins. But have we prayed, Lord, give me the gift of repentance? 
Give me that repentance, that repentance that is true sorrow for sin, because repentance is not only sorrow for sin, although it includes sorrow for sin, but repentance is in the first place sorrow for sin. Yeah, that is included in repentance. But, by the way, are we sorry for something we really enjoyed? And unfortunately, many times, we enjoyed the sin. We don't like the consequences of sin, but we like the sin. And you see, God wants us to give us that sorrow for sin, that hatred for sin, so that we do not even enjoy the sinning part. But that's not enough here. Repentance includes another part, and that is turning away. Turning away from that sin. Now this is why repentance has to come from God, because I'm sorry, I cannot turn away from sin. Turning away from sin is not something that I can do. I need the power of God. I can't even be sorry for it. So you may be sitting right now thinking to yourself, yes, I know many things. I know many things that are written in God's Word. I know what God has said about all these different truths. But I don't feel sorry. Well, don't worry about it you can still ask God right now to give you that repentance so that you can be sorry. It is not natural for the human heart to walk in the ways of God. They are totally different. If you see your sinfulness, do not wait to make yourself better. Don't wait for that. It will never happen. How many there are who think that they are not good enough to come to Christ? Do you expect to become better by your efforts? Do you seriously, honestly expect yourself that you're going to make yourself better, you're going to make yourself good, and then you can come to the Lord? No, it doesn't happen that way. Jeremiah 13, 23 says, Jeremiah 13, 23 says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. That's right. As much as a leopard, if he can change his spots, then you can actually become a good person. So what do we need? We need a change. We need God to come in and make this change for us. There is help for us only in God. We must not wait for stronger persuasions, for better opportunities, or for holier tempers. We can do nothing of ourselves. We must come to Christ just as we are. That's right, sinful, polluted, just the way you are. If Judas would have only recognized that, if he would have realized that he is totally lost without Jesus, and just the way he was, came to Jesus, if he did that, Jesus would have given him the strength. You remember, Peter also denied Christ. But what did Peter do? He looked upon Jesus, and as he looked upon Jesus, his heart was melted, and he experienced repentance. You and I can experience the same thing. But the promise there in Acts chapter 5, verse 30 and 31, not only gives us the gift of forgiveness, but also repentance. But we must do something. There is something that we must do. In order to have this type of repentance, there is a step that comes before it. There is a step that comes right up here, that in order for us to have this repentance, in order for us to have forgiveness, of our sins. In order for that to take place, something else must happen. In 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, we are told what to do. It says there, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here the first step is confession. That's right. We must admit we must admit that we are sinners. We must admit our situation. If we do not admit, then God cannot help us. But look at the wonderful thing here in this verse. If we confess our sins, what does He do? Notice, God does two things. And we need both of those things. He not only gives us forgiveness. It says that we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. Now, what does He cleanse us from? From all unrighteousness. From what? From all unrighteousness. 
I have a question for you. If you confess all your sins before God, if you take all your sins and you confess every one of them that God has brought to your remembrance, what does God do? God will cleanse you. God will first forgive you, then He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now tell me something. If God cleanses you from all unrighteousness, how much unrighteousness do you have left? How much unrighteousness do you have left? Absolutely none. This is the wonderful thing that God has in store. And this is why all through the Bible you find the importance of acknowledging our sins, for admitting that we are sins, that we are sinners, for freely admitting it before God and acknowledging it before Him. If we don't do that, we have no hope. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, this is why this promise is given to us here. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Notice here, there is what? There is no condemnation. Why is there no condemnation? Because there is no sin to condemn. We have confessed our sins before God freely, and He forgave us, and He cleansed us, and there is nothing left there. There is no unrighteousness, and since there is no unrighteousness, there is no condemnation. There is nothing to be condemned with. This is the plan of redemption. This is why confession is so important. This step of confession is so important to freely confess, freely admit our sins. i just like to read some thoughts here that really kind of put all this in, 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 in a little summary here. It says, in these words let a, lies a practical thought and from it arises a question which troubles many. From this one here in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. They say, I believe all that in theory. I am fully in harmony with that. And I know that Christ can cleanse from sin. I believe that if I confess my sin, He is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. But the question in my mind is, have I confessed all my sins? That is what gives me trouble. If I was only sure that I had confessed all my sins, then I could claim that promise and believe that there was no condemnation for me. Oh, only if I could just be assured that I confessed them all. Now, this is something that troubles very many. How are we going to know that we are not under condemnation? We cannot charge God with having left the matter so indeterminate that it is impossible for us to know whether we are condemned or not. Therefore, it must be that we can find out. We may put it this way. I have confessed all the sins that I know of, everything that the Lord has shown me. And when the Lord shows me something else, I will confess that. Of course, confess everything the Lord shows you. But brethren, do not stop halfway. Do not go only halfway. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us Oh, forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then when you have confessed a sin, believe that God forgives it. Believe that and take His peace into your hearts. And if He shows you other sins, confess them. Believe that they are forgiven and have His peace still. But there are scores of honest souls who, are, who deprive themselves of a blessing and finally go out into darkness because when they have confess their sins they did not take forgiveness and thank God for the freedom that must follow you see they confessed their sins but they did not take it with them they, they left it there they, they did not go all the way now the idea conveyed in that expression that we have confessed all the sins that we know of but still we dare not acknowledge freedom from condemnation for fear that there are other sins that we do not know about and therefore have not confessed is really bringing a serious charge against, you know who? Against God. It is making the Lord to be the forgiver of the man who has the best memory. But was it your memory alone that enabled you to remember those sins that you did confess? Is that what your memory did that? Or was it the Holy Spirit prompting you and bringing it to your remembrance. 
Now, are we going to charge God with doing a partial work? He sent His Holy Spirit to show you those sins. Shall we say then that He kept back a part of them that He did not reveal to us? He showed us just what we, He wanted us to confess. And when we have confessed them, we have met the mind and spirit of God and we are free. That's all we have to do. Now suppose, suppose that I went ahead and I injured one of you. I did something wrong to you. I was systematically doing evil against you and accusing you falsely and doing a whole numerous bunch of things. And then one day I find that I realize my evil of my ways and I come to you and I say, excuse me, but can you forgive me of those sins that I have just committed? Now, what are you going to do? Are you going to stand there listening, listening to me when you're through listening and you say, oh, wait a minute. I forgive you for those sins that you just confessed. But you know, there's a whole list here that you didn't confess yet. And I say, oh, yeah, okay. Can you remind me of them? Yes, be glad to. And you go down and you list one after the other and you list the whole list. And when you're done with the list, then I ask you, then now can you forgive me for all of those things? And you say, yeah, but you know, I forgive you for those things, but you know, there are still some things that um, kind of in the back of my mind, I can't remember all of them right now, that you need to forgive, confess me for also. Is that what we're going to do? No. Most of us will never do that. What do we do instead? As soon as a person comes and says, I'm sorry, I did this and this to you, I am really in the wrong. And when we apologize, what do we do? Oh, we say, oh, that's enough. Why? Because those were, we were only confessing those sins to, sh to simply show that we genuinely ask for forgiveness, that we are genuinely sorry for, sin, for those sins. You see, when we talk about God and we talk about our relationship to Him and we talk about our sins, how many sins do we have? If I had to confess every one of my sins that I've ever committed, you know, maybe we'd have probation a lot, we need a lot longer probation. In Psalm chapter 40, verse 12, Psalm chapter 40 and verse 12, For innumerable evils have compassed me about. My iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore, my heart faileth me. Notice here he says, My iniquities are innumerable. They cannot be counted. If we were to look back at all of our iniquities, we couldn't even count them all. So what does God do? God takes the representative sins. He takes them, those sins that stand out prominent in our lives, and He asks us to forgive, confess those. And the Holy Spirit brings it to our remembrance so that we can confess them and that we can go on from there. That is what God is doing to you. Now, what happens in our life when we receive this forgiveness? What happens when we confess our sins, genuinely confess our sins before God? What happens? Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 to 27. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Oh, this is a wonderful thing. God wants to do all this for you. God wants you to begin. God wants you to give true confession, to admit that you have sinned. Admit those sins that you have before God. And once you admit those sins before God, God is going to do the rest. God will take care of the rest. He will, give, he will give you repentance if you ask for it. He will give you forgiveness if you ask for it. He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness if you ask for it. This is what God wants to do. He wants to give you a complete reformation in your life. He will give you a new heart and a new life. You see, 
what God begins, what you allow God to begin here in your heart. He will complete it until the very end. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's right. He has begun a work. He will complete that very work inside of you. In Hebrews chapter 12 verse 12, Hebrews 12 verse 12 says that Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the beginning and the end. If you allow Him, He will begin the work in you. He will bring it up to completion. Now since God is so eager to accomplish this restoration in your life, since God is so eager, He wants to make this change, what should we be doing? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Hebrews 4 verse 16 says, Let us come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Yes, we need to come boldly before that throne of grace. Isaiah 55 verse 6 and 7. Isaiah 55 verse 6 and 7 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Right now is your day of opportunity. Right now is your time where you can find all that peace and joy all at once. In Matthew chapter 11, 28 through 30, and we'll use this as our closing text, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is coming before you. Jesus wants you to take this opportunity. Come unto Jesus. Come the way you are. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about the way you look. Don't worry about the, what you have been doing in your life. It does not matter. The only thing ma that matters is that you are willing to come to Jesus. Come to Him and then be willing to confess your sins. Confess freely before God. And as you confess freely, He will do the rest and He will give you that freedom. He will give you that change. He will give you a new life and new peace. Do you want that? Then now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is your opportunity. Why don't you take this time right now?